7037. Ron is mylender.com. The Inner Voice Show is a dialogue between the host and the listeners about their relationships. This show is not an attempt to assess, diagnose, or treat any mental health or illness condition. Please consult your physician, psychiatrist, or psychotherapist for personal matters. Inner Voice. A heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and this is the Inner Voice Show. Hello to Sean in studio, and a big hello to all of you. This is a show about what matters most in our life, our mind, thoughts, feelings, actions, relationships, and this beautiful journey of life. In this show, I'll bring you the tip of the week about holding high levels of gratitude, especially since... We uh, just came out of Thanksgiving, and uh, we're going into um, holiday week. So uh, holding up our um, chin and uh, creating a space of gratitude is something that we really all need. Then I will um, share with you the latest research about anxiety over public speaking that can be reduced by a public speaking tutor on Amazon Alexa platform. Yes, there was a research done. Then I'll bring you Michael Gilb. He's a pioneer in the field of creative thinking, uh, accelerated learning, and innovative leadership. Today we will be talking about his latest book, Mastering the Art of Public Speaking, Eight Secrets to Transform Fear and Supercharge Your Career. It's an amazing conversation, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. I love to hear from you, so connect with me through my website, fujan.com, and follow my social media and uh, message me with your comments and topic of interest. Um, I really want to um, hear from you and know what it is that you want to for me to talk about. So don't go anywhere. We'll be right back with the tip of the week. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujian Zane. You can get it now at fujian.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Here's the tip of the week. This year, Thanksgiving was different in many ways, and it is reminding us that coming up holidays will be very, very different than years before. And yet, the spirit of loving each other um, remains the same. And having the opportunity to share our love and caring with each other remains similar. Most people had struggled with the get-togethers in how many people to invite, how many would come, how many would show up, how many would be scared to join the family gathering, who would travel in or out. Were the airlines safe to travel? Would they have to be quarantined for two weeks? Um, would they want to wear a mask or they would not want to and they would get into a fight about they should wear a mask when they're outside or inside? Um, was it warm enough to hold a gathering outside or was it cold and everybody had to go in and they were afraid if, if they weren't wearing a mask because they were eating? 
whether they would continue to talk about politics or and respect each other or get upset and get into a fight and kind of like walk out the door. We had to consider being together in many, many different ways, including online. This brought a sense of relief for some people who needed to be with others but could not be there. Yet it also brought sadness to many people who did not have a family to be with or could not join their family while other members of the family were hanging out together. They feel left out. Some did not have the means to create a holiday feast or travel due to losing their jobs. Some felt depressed and isolated. Some were ill in the hospital with the COVID-19 and could not be with their family members. And some had lost their family members and they were grieving. Some are in line for food from food banks and could not afford to have others come in. Many might have not the means to buy gifts for their family this year as the holidays are coming up. But you know what stayed and what remained is the same beautiful wishes that pours in from people who have been around us and all the people who we have not heard from for a long time. This was very apparent. I got messages from a lot of people from around the world just wishing happy Thanksgiving or happy holidays and um, offering their love. And I did the same, going through you know, your contact list and remembering so many people that you might not be in contact with every week or every month. And suddenly gives us the opportunity of saying, I love you and I think of you and I thank you. Um, now these messages could have been by text, by phone calls, um, by FaceTimes or any of the other social media type of ways of sharing this with each other, even putting up uh, pictures or videos that would make people laugh and make their heart warm. Thanksgiving was a great reminder for all of us to appreciate who we are and what we have and all the people who we have around us. So gratitude allows us to connect with ourselves as well as others. This connection creates a sense of belonging and definitely a sense of well-being. So I thank all of you for being in my life in many ways. I'm grateful for being where I am in my life and for all the people who made that possible for me. I'm grateful for having my husband and for being so loving and for family and friends who share their love and resources all the time. And I thank all my amazing clients who allow me into their lives and share themselves with me and allowing me to learn. And I thank you for being with us every week and listening with your heart. So let's keep the spirit of gratitude high and hold it the whole month of December to appreciate who we are. By the way, appreciate your body. You know, my hand, my face, my heart, uh, every organ of my body, my legs are pulling me everywhere. Um, appreciating our mind, our emotions, um, who we are really, our identity that we form, um, our values. Appreciating our friends and family members, our community, and everyone who's on the earth, on earth and move into a spirit of giving and receiving love and appreciation, acceptance of each other. We really need that. We really need to be able to accept and love each other. Stop fighting, really stop fighting and start loving. I think that would be, um, that would make each one of us in a, in a special way, calm inside our body and much more of a um, healthy mind and healthy body and well-being. So may you enjoy every minute of your life with all of its greatness and at times its disappointments. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m 
p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM.com. Well, welcome back. I'm going to share with you the latest research. Anxious about public speaking? Come on. Your smart speaker could help. A team of researchers at Penn State have developed a public speaking tutor on the Amazon Alexa platform. The tutor enables users to engage in cognitive restructuring exercise, a psychological technique that helps anxious individuals recognize and modify negative thinking behaviors. When users deployed the tutor in a recent study, their pre-speech anxiety was relieved. According to the researchers, this study represents a significant shift in our use of smart speakers from a tool that answers question to one that acts as a helper or a coach. I've got to talk to my Alexa a lot more. According to researchers, users' interactions with Alexa not only help to tease, to ease their speech anxiety, and their feedback suggests that the tutor could be a viable alternative to a person-to-person -person coaching sessions. There's often a concern of being judged by human tutors or human therapists. Um, if we can use a machine like Alexa to provide such a training to individuals with speech anxiety or social anxiety, we can help them get rid of their concern of being judged by another human being. In the study, participants were guided to interact with the Amazon Echo smart speaker and were randomly assigned to interact with either a highly social Alexa or one that was less social in its greetings and expressions. The participants were then encouraged to use what they learned to prepare and present a short speech through a virtual reality application that stimulated a room with a 20 person audience. After their speech, participants completed a questionnaire about their experience. So the researchers found that the high sociable condition through which Alexa adopted a more personal conversation style provided a better user experience by establishing the sense of interpersonal closeness with the user. If you think about the usual interactions with Alexa, they're quite dry and very functional, but providing some sort of social cues seems to result in a positive outcome for the user. So people are not simply, um, and through pomorphizing the machine, but are responding to increased soci sociability by feeling a sense of closeness with the machine, which is associated with lowered speech anxiety. So according to researchers, the approach has the potential to assist individuals who are anxious about public speaking from the comfort of their own home. I can imagine all of those people who are afraid of dating uh, online and uh, talking to people can probably exercise with the Alexa also. Hmm. Smart speakers could be utilized similarly um, in future work to explore aiding individuals with the forms of anxiety. Alexa is one of those things that li lives in our home. As such, it occupies a somewhat, a somewhat intimate space in our lives. It's often a conversation partner so why not use it for other things rather than just answering factual questions for you? I've had my fun with Alexa of asking funny questions and they used to be witty much more than now. They're pretty much straight now. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be back with Michael Gelb and talk more about perfecting your um, communication and uh, conversation in public. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it.
Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and I am so excited to have Michael Gelp with us today. He's a pioneer in the field of creative thinking, accelerated learning, and innovative leadership. He leads seminars for organizations such as DuPont, Merck, Microsoft, and Nike. He's the author and the co-author of 16 books, including the international bestseller, How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. But today, we'll be talking about his latest book, Mastering the Art of Public Speaking, Eight Secrets to Transform Fear and Supercharge Your Career. Welcome to this show, Michael. Thank you, wonderful to be with you. So yes, art of public speaking, what we're doing exactly right now, and it never gets old. It seems like the fear is always there, no matter how many times you do this, right? I've done um, television shows and radio shows since 1996. It doesn't matter. Right before, there's this anxiety that shows up. And there's this fear that shows up. And it's much easier, actually, to do it online than being in front of so many people. But you you really go through the uh, specifics in your book about glossophobia, which is the technical term for the fear of public speaking. And um, I guess 74% of Americans suffer from it, and I probably think more. I could say almost <laughs> everyone, right? Those are the ones who are willing to admit it. <laughs> so tell us, um, first of all, what got you to want to, um, you know, master this concept and then write a book about it? What was it for you? Sure. Well, I did not expect to become a public speaker, although I enjoyed debate and argument when I was in high school. I actually won the award in my high school for the class arguer. And to give you an idea of my family, two years later, my younger brother won the same award at the same high school. Because you guys practice together, obviously, at home a lot. We, it was amazing. Everybody talked at once. It wasn't polite. <laughs> it was all out combat, verbal combat. So, I became fascinated by creativity, not just artistic creativity, but how people could learn to live more creative lives. And I was blessed to meet a gentleman who was one of the top public speakers, an author, television personality when I was living in London in the mid 1970s. And he invited me to speak to one of the groups that uh, he was uh, taking away on a five-day retreat at a, a five-star resort in Veve, Switzerland. So I was 25, 26 years old, and I went along and I spoke to them, and they liked what I said. So they invited me to these events all over the world, and they, in those days, they used to fly me first class put me up in a five-star resort. I would speak, which I love to do. People would pay attention. They wouldn't interrupt or yell or scream at me like my family. <laughs> and then the best part was they'd give me money. Awesome. So I thought this is just a dream come true. So I just started flying all over the world, giving speeches and doing seminars, getting paid. and in attempting to help people become creative and especially working with companies to help mm -hmm. create a more creative, innovative culture for the organization, for the business. I started to do more than just give speeches. I started to consult and coach and work with leaders on how do you create that more creative, innovative environment. So I became fascinated by leadership. And then I realized for many of my clients, they, they needed to be able to speak about the culture, about innovation, and they had the fear of public speaking. So they asked me to coach them 
and I started coaching them and I developed seminars on how do you do this? And it worked. So I've been teaching this for since really the late seventies and I put everything I learned in the new book. <laughs> That's amazing. I just want to share with you uh, an experience that I had. Um, I'm sure you've heard of master, um, Toastmasters. And I had um, first heard of Toastmasters um, in, uh, I think it was 2000 or no, no, yeah, 2000. And I um, developed and created a transitional housing for domestic violence, um, the women who were abused. And then this church beside us um, just sent a flyer and said the Toastmaster group was going to be there. And I'm like, it's obviously it's for public speaking, but it's like, oh, I'm just going to, I had 30 women who were living at that time on the transitional housing. And, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, low self-esteem. They've been abused. They, they just think they're nothing at that moment. They can't really go. And we, they, we had to prepare them to go for job interviews, you know. So I had sent them um, to this group. Uh, oh my God, if I got a video of three months, like at the time and then three months, like the before and after video, the amount of self-esteem and self-confidence that got created just by the knowledge of how to speak outwardly in front of others for any purpose, whether they're giving a seminar or whether they're getting prepared for an interview, you know, being in, going into a family gathering where people with social anxiety really, really go in and, you know, they have to drink or use drugs in order to, like, to let go of their anxiety to be able to go out there or performance. So um, I hope that everybody hears us that this is, this is, truly important even if you're not if you don't think of public speaking only as if like i'm going to go in front of somebody and give lectures and every day you're going to be able to use these tools so get the book okay now let's go with this. go ahead but thank you so much too because you just in an elegant and articulate manner conveyed one of the essential messages of the book actually you you conveyed three of the essential messages of the book. The first is that this public speaking isn't just for professional public speakers, it's for everybody. You also made the point so profoundly that if you wanna make a difference in the world, if you wanna help other people, if you wanna champion the rights and opportunities of anybody who's disadvantaged or disenfranchised, and, and needs someone to speak up for them. You went and spoke to these people and you inspired them. And you transformed your own fear and your own anxiety. It doesn't make it go away, but you turned it into enthusiasm for transformation and helping other people. And because you had a higher purpose, it organized the butterflies that you had so that they fly in formation and you make a difference in other people's lives. Then by teaching them to speak up, it people who might feel that they are disadvantaged or disenfranchised in some way. And then you made one other point that I emphasize in the book as well. I specifically recommend Toastmasters or any other form of supportive community practice because this is a skill. It's like any other skill. If you wanna get good at piano, you can say, well, I have a fear of piano playing. Yeah, well, if, if you never had a lesson and you don't know where the notes are, you shouldn't be performing piano yet. You need to learn how to sit there. What are the notes? How to play them? Then you do etudes and you play different combinations and you get the fingering. And then before you know it, you're playing Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then you're playing Mozart's Sonata in C. And then a few years later, you're giving concerts at, at Thanksgiving. And then if you keep up with it, who knows what might happen? You could actually become a concert pianist. That's how learning a skill happens. And you're gonna, you're gonna miss a lot of notes. So you wanna miss the notes in practice. 
And Toastmasters is a chance to miss the notes in a, in a very supportive, very positive environment so that your fear gets transformed into enthusiasm and excitement. And then you realize you're getting a little bit better every day. And before you know it, you're changing the world with the power of your voice. Absolutely. I think that it, uh, you could use this in any type of relational aspect. I've sent people and I've asked them to look at different types of videos when um, they wanted to just go, go to school when people wanted to start dating, when maybe they got, maybe it's a beginning, you know, they're young and they're beginning years of dating, or they have been married and for many years and they got divorced after like 30 years of being married. And for the first time they're out there and trying to, uh, you know, get into relationships again, they are scared of going out and talking to anyone. So it's any type of social anxiety. I think that the art of public speaking, when they learn these tools, it, they could use it anywhere. So you say in order to flow, think like a pro. That's right. And, uh, you lay down the foundation in learning how to be clear and present uh, when you're in front of um, other group. Um, that is so important because people can be humorous. People can talk about stories. They can come up with everything. But if the message is not clear, the message gets lost. Like you could be entertained by somebody talking, but at one point you're like, huh, what? Like, what did they say? What was the point? So I think, I think that being, uh, you know, clear in what is the point that you want to, uh, to um, present is so important. Can you share some with us? Yes, thank you for asking that because that it's the simplest way to transform social anxiety and the fear of public speaking. Ab There's so many other methodologies, but the absolute simplest way is to, is to focus on the audience instead of yourself. That's what a professional speaker does. We realize we're here to serve the audience. And there's a reason that an audience is coming to hear you, whatever it happens to be, whether it's informal, whether it's a, a, a team meeting, or whether it's an actual stand-up presentation, whether it's in a virtual modality or in an actual room with, with other people. So what happens, here's the objective that most people have for their presentation. It's unconscious. And it's something like this. Get through this without embarrassment or humiliation. So when that's your motivation, it brings out your worst. <laughs> so, so what we teach people to do, the simplest thing is write down, and it actually makes a difference to write it down because it gets you more focused. Write down specifically what do you want the audience to know as a result of your presentation? What would you like them to feel as a result of your presentation? And what do you want them to do as a result of your presentation? And the motto for writing down what you want them to know is KISS, keep it simple speaker. So one misunderstanding about oral presentation and these are some of the worst presentations you'll ever go to, are when people feel that the reason they're there is to take everybody through 147 minute points of data. No, that should be the handout that everybody reads before or after. The purpose of oral presentation is to get people usually to do something or to stop doing something. You want them to buy something, you want them to buy into an idea, you want them to sign a petition. You want them to provide funding for something. You want them to stop fouling the environment. There's some behavioral outcome. So identify what that is. That's what you want them to do. What you want them to know is what they need to know in order to do that. But if you really want your presentation to be effective, it's very important to write down how you want the audience to feel because people buy on emotion and they justify with fact. And if you don't appeal to them emotionally as well as intellectually, you may not, you might win their mind, but not their hearts. And you've got to get their hearts and their minds to get their bodies into action. Moreover, 
emotions are contagious for better or for worse. So if you focus on how you want them to feel, you will be radiating that feeling and it will be positively contagious. If, if you want them to be inspired, you're gonna be more inspiring, for example. So write down what the message is that you want them to think, you want them to feel, you want them to do. And um, you let them know what you want them to do and then systematically tell them how to be able to, what, what are the steps that they, they can do in order to do that and create the result. You also say empathize with your audience, like get to know them, who are they? Who is it that you're talking to? And um, maybe what feelings they might have or the, the assumptions or presumptions of that and then empathize with them and also that that's where you connect into emotions with them? Is that what you're saying? Very much so. So there's, there's empathy on a couple of levels. The first level is in preparation, is to do some research to put yourself in the mind and the heart of the people who will be attending the presentation. Why are they there? Did their boss send them? Most of the speeches I've had to give over the years for money, I've had to give to people who didn't necessarily sign up to be there. It's not like doing public speaking where, I've done plenty of things where people pay to come and see me. And I love that because those people, they're standing ovations every time. Uh, that's fantastic. I never have an issue with that. Uh, but I work, as you mentioned the list of some of the corporations I've spoken for, and those are usually the boss tells you you have to go to this. So you have these really busy people and they're sitting there like this and they're looking at me like, gee, why am I, you know, I could, I have, you're taking me away from work, I have to. So I have to win those people over. And in order to do that, I tune in. So first of all, I empathize with why they don't want to be there. But I go deeper and I figure out why they, might really want to be there, but don't know it yet. And I tell them that right away. <laughs> and by tuning into them, by focusing on them, it first of all, you, you don't get nervous because you're not, you're focused on helping them. It's right. not about me, it's about them. And people sense, people sense that you are there and that you've thought about it that you've thought about why are you speaking to them and, and and some of this is is it's so simple but well i'll tell you for many years i actually i used to do speaking and seminars for the united states postal service at the postal service training center down in washington dc when i lived there for many years i lived in dc and i spoke for them at a really big conference and there was another speaker at this really big conference. And he was talking to, the, to this huge group of postal service people and made the mistake of saying that he had his materials fed X'd to, <laughs> to him at his hotel for the presentation. You've never seen somebody lose an audience faster because this person didn't think through, who am I talking to? Right. So <laughs> this, is, this is not really that doesn't require advanced thinking to just tune in and say, I'm talking to the postal service. I might wanna share stories or say things that are supportive of the postal service and not make references to my use of their competitor, for example. So it's being thoughtful, just like you wanna be thoughtful if you're at a party. You know, the best guest at a party is the person who asks you about you, who's empath empathetic with how you feel, who seems paying, to be present paying care. Yeah, paying attention to the outside world instead of only in your own mind and thinking, what am I gonna say? Pay attention out there. And when you pay attention, you can gather that data also, right? It's pretty, it's, this is simple. It's simple to do. People say, oh, I'm scared of giving you a presentation. I say, well, 
tell me about your last vacation. And then they tell me, oh, it was so great. We went to Bermuda. We stayed at this really nice uh, Airbnb. I couldn't believe how great it was. And we went to the beach every day. We went sailing. We went on a glass bottom boat. We, it was one, people are natural. They're fluid. They never say, um, ah, or, you know, they just tell the story. That's how to give a presentation. Find the story that makes your point. Tell it in a natural, easy way. That's what professional speakers do. Right. And that's what all of us can do. You then talk about how to use your mind map um, to generate, organize, and remember your messages, like blend, blending your right brain and left brain and creativity and uh, create, bring your creativity. And obviously you wrote the book about how does uh, Leonardo da Vinci think. So bringing creativity up with all of that into your presentation. Yes. So creative, if you understand the creative process, if you do know how to think like Leonardo da Vinci, and in the How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci book, I, I introduce everybody to mind mapping. It's the methodology I've used to write all of my books and to prepare all of my presentations throughout my career. It's also the methodology that my students who've gone on to become very successful at public speaking have utilized to not only generate more creative presentations, but to actually remember their own message because it's a much more memorable way to put your ideas together because it uses keywords and images which are easier for our brains to remember. So one of the really fun things, we're getting a lot of fun feedback about the Mastering the Art of Public Speaking book and people are really amazed at the mind maps at the end of every chapter including the chapter that teaches you how to make a mind map to make your presentation because you read the chapter and then you look at the one page mind map at the end of the chapter and it has everything in that whole chapter on that one page. Then at the end of the book, there are two pages that have a big mind map of everything in the whole book. Wow. So let's say you were giving a presentation on this book or a seminar on it. You have all your notes in the mind map at the end of the book. Let's say you wanted to give a presentation to your colleagues about mind mapping. You could take the mind map at the end of the chapter on mind mapping and use it as your notes to give that presentation because it's amazingly efficient, simple, clear way to take a lot of complex material and make it memorable and accessible. And it's, it's a lively, imaginative, creative process so that when you're aiming to think of the stories or the jokes that you wanna tell this audience, it's easier to generate those stories and link them to your objectives than it is through any other method that I know of. I remember going to a presentation uh, with someone who was an amazing um, speaker and they were on radio and television for decades. And it was right at the time that this concept got more into public speaking about uh, sharing, you know, doing your talk only within and through stories. Um, and it's probably about, let's say um, 10 years that this is more, I, I can see it more, where it's not that you talk about the message on a didactic level and then you give a, a particular story. It's more like you share the story and within the story, you go from one story to another and the points are supposed to be in it. But what happened was that we got, as a listener, we got so much into the story that we lost the points that were going from one story to the next to the next. And I remember um, when she came down from the podium and you know, we, we were talking and she says, well, how, how did I do? And I said, I loved every story, but to be honest with you, I got to know you, but I had no idea what the message of the conversation was because I just got lost in the stories. Although they were beautiful, you were saying it so eloquently that I was like, you made me be there. But then I didn't get, what was it that you went up there for, except getting to know you more beautifully. So it's, um, so it's also, you've you talk about how to organize 
your message or that it's not lost, that the listener picks it up, that the audience remembers the message, uh, although they get to know you and get entertained by the stories and, you know, their feelings are um, activated by your stories and the imagery, but there was a message into this, right? And then for them to be able to hear the message, recall it, uh, and understand it uh, so that they really take something, especially as you said, if you want them to do something, to remember at the end to do that, right? Well, this is this is very, very important. Glad we're emphasizing this for everyone because your objective is not just to get people to like you and laugh and enjoy your story. Your objective is make sure they know what you want them to know feel how you want them to feel and do what you want them to do. So if you begin by writing down your objectives in terms of the audience, then when you're making your mind map and thinking of creative stories and jokes, you're gonna be more focused on those objectives. But just to make sure that you don't get carried away with your own wonderful story, the one of the eight secrets that we go into in the book is how to structure your presentation based on research into the psychology of memory so that the audience not only understands what you want them to know, feel and do, but remembers it. So, you focus on the outcome at the beginning, you repeat what you want them to know, you tell stories to emphasize and make outstanding what you want them to remember, you link it to them so that they can relate to it, you make it personally associated, and then before you finish, you get them, the, the most elegant way to do this is to get people to tell you what they understood from what you just shared and what they're gonna do about it. And it's good, people will stand up and say, I'm gonna do this, this, and this, and you get them to say that. And then you get your audience to do public speaking where they commit publicly to do something related to what you want them to know, feel, and do. And that's part of how you know you've given a truly effective presentation. Michael, what is the difference that you've experienced um, between public speaking where we actually did go in front of people and do it versus now that a lot of it is online and on um, Zoom and other platforms when we have you know hundreds of people, thousands of people who are there and um, we do get to do some of this, which is, you know, have them talk publicly in front of others and but some of them will just kind of like chat on the side. Um, how does how is it different for you when you do that? Well, the, the virtual presentation space. So I'm giving virtual keynotes. I led a full two day seminar for a master's of science in management program at the Fordham University Gabelli Business School. I'm teaching a course to executive MBAs, which is three four hour sessions on Zoom. So I'm doing a lot with students. And what's really cool, by the way, is I just love that I can have students all over the world and we can be together in this modality. Now, in some ways it's more challenging because as you point out, I, I can't see everyone. I can see some of them and I cue in on them and I am reading their body language just like I do with my regular audience. And I am noticing if they're laughing at my jokes but most of them I can't see. So I have to reach out more energetically to tune into those people and, and empathize with them, many of them by themselves, quarantined somewhere. So it's even more important that I help them feel good and inspired about what they're learning. And in essence, what I, what I did say in the book, because I had a chance to do the final draft of the manuscript at the beginning of the pandemic. So I knew we were in for something and I knew we'd all be on Zoom. And I've been doing a lot of things on Zoom and Skype and Webinar Jam before that anyway. 
I didn't have to change anything in the book other than to say, everything you're learning in this book is even more important. Because if you look, for example, you've created a beautiful background. You place yourself elegantly in the center of that beautiful background. You have a nice smile. You present yourself in a way that is beautifully in alignment with what I ask people to do. I have done my best to do the same thing. We bought the best camera we could find. We got the best lighting we could get. Setting your stage is even more important. I have a CEO client and he was having to do a meeting with a very challenging group, the founder of the company, the biggest investor, a couple other investors, and he was sort of on the hot seat. And in previous meetings, I noticed that his posture was a little bit like this and that he, he kept making defensive gestures. And he said some words over and over again, cliches. So I coached him. I did a private coaching session with him before this big meeting. And the coaching was really simple. It was a line around the vertical axis, smile like the Mona Lisa, and I'm gonna fine you a significant amount of money if you say any one of the cliches that you usually say. <laughs> and what was fabulous is, we, and we practice, but the next Zoom, when the founder and the biggest investor started grilling him, he kept his Mona Lisa Buddha smile. He stayed upright. He didn't start cowering. And his executive presence was incomparably great from what he did not do. Now, that turns out to be just what you need to do if you're on stage in front of uh, 10,000 people. Yeah, people, there's a, on my website, one of the images we have is me walking on stage uh, to this group of about 10,000 people. And you can see, I couldn't be happier. <laughs> if you walk onto that stage of 10,000 people like this, yeah, it is over. <laughs> so just learning, and but you have to practice. Don't try to do it. Don't try to be upright and poised the first time in front of 10,000 people. Practice it at Toastmasters. Practice it with your friends. Practice it on a small Zoom with a few people. And then you, what you realize is your voice works better. Your brain works better. Other people perceive you with being more poised, more authority, because of what you do not do. No fidgeting, no wiggling, no blathering. <laughs> We're talking about background. I just wanted to tell you how much I love that. Um, um, the greenery that comes from top to bottom that is such a beautiful effect. I, I keep looking at it. I'm like, you talked about background. I'm like, I want to share that with you. That is beautiful. It's all real too. It's all real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it <looks good. coughs> Michael, you also talk about this. We don't have um, a lot of time, but I really wanted to ask you about this. You talk about Alexander technique to being the most helpful method of developing public speaking. Can you share a bit about that, please? Sure. Well, I originally trained as a teacher of the Alexander Technique in London. That's, that's how I met the gentleman who was this world-class public speaker because he was coming to take Alexander Technique lessons with my teacher because he knew that the Alexander Technique was the method that they taught at the Royal Academy of Drama and the Royal Academy of Music and the Juilliard School and many of the world's leading academies for performance arts for developing powerful stage presence. And he wanted to strengthen his own stage presence. So Alexander is the trade secret, the methodology that many of the most renowned actors, actresses, conductors, singers, musicians have been studying for since, since they went to Juilliard or the Royal Academy of Music or Drama. Paul Newman, uh, Joanne Woodward, Sting, 
John Cleese, uh, the list goes on and on, uh, Sigourney Weaver, uh, David Hyde Pierce. Uh, I, I, I ran into Sigourney Weaver and David Hyde Pierce in New York. I'm pointing to New York, it's 25 miles that way because one of my best friends is, is one of the best Alexander Technique teachers in New York. And they're just there for lessons. Just They're just students because even though they're already famous, accomplished performers, they want to keep raising their game. So Alexander is the methodology for developing that, that poise and that stage presence. Beautiful. Thank you. And how could they find it at you talk about it in your book. Also, yes. Right? So in, in Mastering the Art of Spe Public Speaking, I talk, uh, there's a section about the Alexander Technique. And my very first book is called Body Learning, an Introduction to the Alexander Technique. And I'm pleased to say that it's about to enter its 41st year of being in print. Wow. Beautiful. Michael, in one minute, if there's anything we haven't talked about that you really, really want our audience to know, what would that be? Gee, there's so much. <laughs> I, I would say, but let's go, let's just really simple, really simple, because we, the worse you think you are at this, the more fear you have of it, the more it's going to change your life when you learn these simple secrets and begin to apply them. Beautiful. So everyone, Michael Gilb, Mastering the Art of Public Speaking, Eight Secrets to Transform Fear and Supercharge Your Career. You can find him at michaelgilp.com, michaelgilp.com. And uh, Michael, thank you so much for uh, taking the time and being with us and um, sharing your book with us. What a pleasure. Thank you. And for all of you who are out there, create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you. And until next week, bye-bye.